Vai eu. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're just waiting for a few more attendees. Excuse me, we're waiting for a few more attendees and we will begin the event shortly. Thank you. Hello, Stephen. Stephen, how are you? 
Hello, Saeed. Are you okay? Good. Good to see you. A young man, activist. Oh dear, oh dear. Do you think you, uh, in your lifetime, have you improved the human rights in the world? Can, can they be improved with these dictators? Indeed, they can. It also, unless we change them, unless you change the dictatorship, uh, they, no dictator will ever respect the human rights. <clears throat> Right, I think um, I think we have the majority of attendees with us now. So um, I just like to welcome everybody first of all, and thank you all for being here today um, at this event, which is hosted by the Bahrain Institute for Rights and Democracy (BIRD) and by Americans for Human Rights and Democracy in Bahrain (ADHRB), um, and which is to mark the 22nd International Day in support of victims of torture. My name is Josie Tum, and I'm honoured to represent BIRD at this event. So before we begin, um, I'd just like to notify everybody that this event will be live streamed and maybe broadcast on television. So if you're not comfortable appearing on the stream, please disable your video and change your display name now. Um, I'd also like to ask everybody to mute themselves for the moment. Um, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at a later stage. And just one reminder that we will be tweeting throughout the event. So please do engage um, and follow us on Twitter at, at Bird Bahrain and sorry, at Bird Bahrain underscore and also at ADHRB. Great. So um, let's begin. So on behalf of Bird and ADHRB, um, I'd like to offer our very warm thanks to panelists and for everybody um, who is joining us at home in order to mark this important day and for standing in solidarity with torture survivors in Bahrain and around the world. Um, I'd like to extend a special welcome to the Bahraini survivors of torture who are joining us today, uh, particularly Ebtisam Al Sayyid, Najah Yusuf, and to the recently released Haja Mansour, all of whom are joining us from Bahrain. Um, all three of these incredibly brave women were recently featured in BBC Arabic's powerful documentary entitled Breaking the Silence, uh, from which we'll be sharing a few clips later on. And we are so happy, of course, to see all of them free and here with us today. Welcome. So um, as many of you will know, torture remains a widespread and systematic problem in Bahrain. And despite years of supposed reform, torture continues to play a central role in the justice system in the country to this day. False confessions extracted under torture are frequently used to sentence innocent people to lengthy prison sentences, and in some cases to death. Indeed, last week, Bahrain's highest court upheld the death sentences of Zuhaya Ibrahim, a 40-year-old father of five, who was subjected to some of the most brutal torture my colleagues and I have ever heard of. Equally, this January, Bahrain reimposed the death sentences against inmates Mohammed Ramadan and Hussein Musa, despite considerable evidence that both men were tortured. Today, we pay tribute to these people and also to Bahraini opposition leaders and rights activists who remain unjustly imprisoned, including Naji Fatil, Dr. Abdul Jalil Al Singais, Abdul Hadi Al Khawaja, Sheikh Ali Salman. Abdul Wahab Hussein, Ali Al Haji, and female political detainee Zakia Al Barbori. Unfortunately, the abuse of prisoners does not end after interrogation, and hundreds of political prisoners continue to suffer ill treatment in Bahraini detention centres to this day. Prisons in Bahrain have become notorious for the systematic ne medical negligence of political prisoners which has emerged as one of the most insidious and dangerous forms of torture used in the country. Many inmates, including aging political leaders like Hassan Mushaima and Dr. Abdul Jalil Al Singais, have been routinely denied appropriate medical care, leaving many in agonizing pain and putting their lives at risk. To make matters worse, due to the coronavirus pandemic, prison authorities have now canceled all ex uh, 
of the care. Actually, just this morning, Bird received a call from the political detainee, Ahmed Al Mahfoud, who's been suffering from a tooth infection and enduring sleepless nights for over a week without any medical treatment. So despite these immense obstacles faced by Bahraini activists, dissidents and human rights defenders, there is a lot of fantastic work being done to promote positive change throughout the country. Um, one example is that today The Guardian has reported that a cross-party group of MPs and peers urged the Foreign Office to secure the release of the imprisoned Saudi activist Lujain al Hathloun, Emirati activist Ahmed Mansour and the Bahraini blogger and rights defender Dr Abdul Jalil al -Singhez. It is really great to see this initiative getting mainstream national coverage um, and I believe that a number of the letter signatories are in attendance with us today. So on this slightly more positive note, um, I would now like to introduce you all to our panel of experts who have all in their own ways contributed to the international campaign to rid the world of the scourge of torture. Um, each of these people will have the opportunity to say a few words. And then after all panelists have spoken, we will open up the floor to questions for each speaker. Um, so please bear in mind that you'll have the chance to ask questions later on um, upon listening to the speakers. So first of all, we have Joe Stork joining us, um, who is the Deputy Director of Human Rights Watch's Middle East and North Africa Department, um, as well as a renowned authority on the topic of human rights in the Arab Gulf. Um, Joe kindly learnt Bird his expertise last year when we worked on our Breaking the Silence report about the situation of women political detainees in Bahrain, and we are delighted to have him with us today. Um, welcome, Joe. And if I may, I will hand the floor over to you. Okay, thank you, Josie. Uh, thank you to Bird and uh, or BIRD. Let me say it straight. And uh, ADHRB for organizing this event, and thanks to you all for joining us. Um, so I've been asked to talk about torture and accountability. Uh, and I think accountability is the key issue here. Um, I mean, Bahrain has long had a somewhat deserved reputation as kind of a torture island in the Gulf. Uh, I've been involved in documenting the issue since 1996. So about a quarter of a century, starting with my first visit there in, in, the, in that year in 1996. Um, accountability is important, of course, for, for justice, and that's how we usually think of accountability, but it's also important as a, as a deterrent. So without accountability, you have, you have no deterrence against the uh, recurrence of, of torture, the repeating of torture, the endemic character of torture, as, we, as it's experienced in Bahrain, as well as too many other countries. So I, I want to give a sort of a, an overview of the of the picture. Um, you know, when I first started working on Bahrain, it was still, uh, in a sense, the bad old days. Uh, my conclusion will be that we're sort of back with the bad old days. Uh, there was a moment of kind of relief after uh, King Ahmad took power in 1999 in the early years of the 2000s. Um, with the various reforms like the abolition of the state security courts, um, bring, welcoming back uh, exiles, who, dissident exiles into, into the country. There was a political opening, a genuine political opening. It didn't, certainly didn't go far enough, but it was genuine. And there was a subsistence, uh, a subsiding of, of torture, frankly. Uh, many of us were hopeful with that sign, but the problem is essentially that accountability was not part of the picture there. Basically, the reason for it is that there, would, there had been a, a, a very not notable decrease in political tensions, a decrease in street confrontations, a decrease in arrests, a decrease in prosecutions, and hence, in that context, a, a, a notable de decrease in the use of torture. But as soon as political tensions started to rise again around 2007, 2008, once again, we started to hear uh, allegations uh, of torture from people who had been arrested, put in detention and so forth. There was a very early indication 
that accountability was not going to be part of the picture when uh, the king decreed in, in, in 2002, he issued a decree basically extending an earlier amnesty to specifically include security officers uh, who might be accused of, uh, of human rights, serious human rights violations like torture. So they too were amnestied. Again, a, ver a very clear and disturbing sign that uh, accountability was, was not part of the picture. As the tensions of, and political confrontations mounted, uh, culminating in a sense in the 2011 uprising of February, March that year. Um, you're familiar, I'm sure, with the, the report of the BICI, the uh, Bahrain Independent Commission of Investigation. Uh, international experts, uh, non-Bahrainis, who came in and uh, conducted a months long investigation, took testimonies, uh, examined documents and so forth, and concluded that you know, torture was definitely part of the, uh, part of the arsenal of repression um, and an immense arrest campaign. Um, and uh, in the words of the, uh, of the commission report, a systematic practice of physical and psychological mistreatment in many cases amounting to torture with respect to a large number of detainees in custody. Now, the, the uh, Biki, the commissioners laid out a set of recommendations. Bahrain, the government of King Hamad in a public ceremony accepted the recommendations, accepted the report and the recommendations. Some reforms, basically issues where the government could throw money at the problem, they did. So for instance, one of the recommendations what was put CCTV cameras in interrogation rooms. In, in, so they did that. They bought CCTV, they installed them, not universally. Uh, and of course, part of the problem was, again, without accountability, the locale of torture shifted from interrogation rooms to, to, to other places, to hallways, to rooftops, to, to schoolyards, and so forth. Um, this, 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 is, this, was a, this was a serious problem. The recommendations calling for uh, examination and, and, and uh, release of prison, release from prison of the people who had convicted of, uh, of political crimes, basically calling for a republic, for instance. Uh, some of them, you heard some of their names earlier from Josie, uh, got life sentences for that. Uh, people, there was no uh, uh, investigation and certainly no prosecutions as recommended by Biki of the higher ups in the Ministry of Interior or the Public Prosecution Office or any of the political echelon. The only investigations and prosecutions that took place were of fairly low level uh, officers. So, and in, in many cases, they weren't even Bahrainis, they were Pakistani officers. So you had this one case of uh, where, um, a, a detainee had been uh, had been had been purposely intentionally beaten to death by two Pakistani uh, guards. They were sentenced to what ended up being two years in prison. Um, the uh, meanwhile, you have people like Abdul Jalil Singhais and Abdul Hadi Khawaja serving life life terms. Um, this uh, it was it was it was this situation that that basically led. Um, uh, Bas Sharif Basiuni, who headed the Biki Commission, to say in 2015, the public prosecution, I'm quoting here, has not has yet to investigate over 300 cases of alleged torture, some involving deaths in custody. There have been no investigations, let alone prosecutions for command responsibility, even at the su supervisory level of people killed in custody as a result of torture. Uh, Nigel Rodley, who was another commissioner and a former special rapporteur uh, for the UN on, on the torture issue, uh, noting, noting this disparity between two years for beating a person to death and life sentence for calling for a, a republic, a change of government, concluded that, quote, the system as a whole finds dissent more dangerous than official criminality. One of the uh, reform, one of the recommendations that the Biki commissioners made um, was uh, t stripping the NSA, the National Security Agency, of its powers of arrest and detention and interrogation. That was a good move 
because the NSA uh, officers were primarily responsible for much of the abuse that occurred in 2011, 2012. But then that one, one of the very few positive steps the government took, it rescinded in early 2017 when the King restored the arrest, interrogation, detention powers of the NSA. So essentially we're back in the situation today where we, we're, we're looking at a country where independent media are barred. In fact, the man I referred to before who was beaten to death in custody was one of the founders of the El Wasat, the one quasi semi-independent newspaper that uh, news source that Bahrainis had for a number of years, but no more. Opposition groups have been closed down. Tweeters like Nabil Rajab have been prosecuted for saying that there are people are being tortured in Jao prison. Uh, as Josie alluded to, we're talking about mass trials. The, what had been a moratorium on the death penalty has been breached uh, uh, several times. Um, so we're looking at a, at a country that in many ways looks disturbingly like the country I first visited in 1996. I'm gonna stop there. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. It is great to have your, your expert insights on this front and hear from you, particularly regarding the lack of accountability as well as impunity, which, which facilitate the ongoing use of torture in Bahrain um, amongst other rights violations. Um, I believe that we now have a message from um, the pol political prisoner and rights activist Ali Al Haji, who is currently incarcerated in Bahrain, um, that we would like to share with everybody following following that excellent um, input by Joe Stork. Thank you, Joe. Um, so I think my colleagues, if I'm not mistaken, will now stream that Ali's message. Great, thank you, everybody. I would like to express my solidarity with political activists and human rights defenders, especially those struggling from within dictatorship regimes present. Presence that fails to maintain the most basic human rights standards. I am proud of my solidarity because I myself am a victim of torture inflicted inside Bahrain prisons. I am serving an unjust 10 year sentence since May 2013 after enduring in a prison for seven years. Prison authorities are inflicting more torture through denying me basic medical care. I urge Bahrain authorities to put an immediate end to all, all forms of physical as well as mental torture and do justice to all victims. Thanks, Ali Al Haji Joe, present 16th of June 2020. Thank you, Julie, for playing that important message from Ali Al Haji, um, who bravely recorded that for this event from Jail Prison. Um, I think we will now play a short clip from the BBC Arabic documentary Breaking the Silence. Um, thank you, everybody, for your attention. Julie, I'll hand it over to you once again. Bahrain is one of the most secretive countries in the Middle East and also one of the most repressive. But protesters continue to defy the government and have once again taken to the streets. The regime does not want these pictures to be seen or these stories of abuse, never broadcast before, to be heard. 
فكرت اني ارمي روحي من الدريشه، هل بيعرفون ان نجاح راح تروح هل انا تعرضت الى التحرش الجنسي والاعتدال؟ These women are being enormously praised in these very conservative societies to talk about sexual assault. The kingdom says it maintains a zero tolerance policy towards human rights violations. In this film, we investigate Bahrain's record and ask whether the West's support for the regime makes it complicit in the alleged abuses. تكلم عن الحين من تسع سنوات بوسط صمت دولي Great, thank you very much, Judy, for sharing that clip. Um, and as everybody can see, Najah, Yusuf and Abdusama Sayyid um, enabled this documentary to happen and bravely spoke out about their experiences um, of assault and torture as well. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that. Um, and I do recommend that everybody watch the documentary in full. Um, so we will now move on to our next speaker. Um, we are honored to have with us today Ab Ali Abdulamam, who is an award-winning Bahraini activist, a torture survivor himself, and the founder of the influential blog Bahrain On Online. Um, Ali, I believe, will be sharing with us uh, points regarding his own personal experience. Ali, many, thank you, many thanks for joining us, and um, I'll pass the floor over to you. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? We can, we can hear you. Hello, Ali. Welcome. Hi, yeah. How are you? Uh, first of all, thanks for uh, inviting me to be one of the speakers for your um, event today, which is marked the, uh, in, uh, the day of uh, supporting the victim of torture. Um, allow me to speak in um, two subjects. First of all, about my own experience, and the second is what to expect uh, from what we've been through. Uh, since I've been a, a child, I've been listening and hearing about others who've been tortured, or been arrested, the way they were torturing them. I mean, I'm talking about the 80s and early 90s. Um, I have I have some good stories and I have some theory about what will happen to me if I've been arrested. But what happened to me in 2010 when I've been arrested and tortured is far beyond what I was imagined. And I can claim that I'm a good reader and I read about, uh, I read a lot of books about torture from different countries, but what I've been facing it in 2010, it's just changing every aspect or every about it's not uh, the goal of the torture is not just to pull or deduce some information or uh, uh, or to tell them what you are hiding from information it's to destroy you destroy you emotionally personality you destroy your personality it's kind of a mechanical or a system that its target is just to destroy those who dare to opposite us. I've been wondering why do, I mean, the first day, I remember exactly that the first day of my arrest in 2010, I've been asking myself this question, why do they hate us that much? I, I don't know, I, I've never been, I never met these people. They've been, the, the way they torture me, the way they, shout at me the way they uh, insist to humiliating me don't call yourself you by your name choose the worst animal that you hated to call yourself by it don't uh, ask for help from god or from anyone because nobody here we are the god this is one of the statement that i heard it from the officers we are the god in this facility you god cannot enter or protect or do anything to you we are everything all the power we have and uh, i heard him shouting that officer once he said that don't rely on the ngos because they cannot protect you we have a green light from the king to do whatever we want, even to kill you. Oh, okay, it's might not true, but this is again, another way of torturing you emotionally and destroying 
any hope inside you that there might, there might be uh, some pressure from outside to release you or at least to uh, stop the torturing against you. So <clears throat> I, it's okay to read about oh, torture. Uh, we... Hello? Sorry, wait, there, was a, there was a problem with the connection. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Um, if you're able to turn your video on, Ali, it will help everyone engage I'm a bit trying, with what you're but saying. I... If you can't. I am trying to turn it on, but I thought uh, it's being turned off from your side. From my side, it's turned on. I believe it's working now, Ali. Um, thank you so much. Please, please. Is it continue. working now? Is it working? No, it's not. I don't think it's working. Uh, um, let me just check very quickly. Because from my side, it's saying that that video is streaming. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I, I pressed the wrong button. Yeah, yeah. From my side, it says to, the video is the streaming. I don't know what's wrong with it. But uh, anyhow, do you want me to continue as an, an audio only or? Yeah. If you prefer that. Please continue, Ali. We 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 can alien, and that's the most important thing. Thank you so much. Okay, so please go ahead, yeah, Ali. Thank you. Yeah, the first point I want to mention is that it's totally different between what you are uh, reading or hearing about stories that pe people being victim of torture and the actual experience that you going through. The torture changed me, changed my life, changed the way I look into the things, changed the way I can be secure about or confident about myself and about the surrounding. You are always suspected that someone is watching you, even in your electronic devices. So um, this is the first point. The, the, I, the other point I wanna highlight it is what, can you expect after the torture from others, either it's the international community or the international NGOs? What I've discovered that, or what I realized is that the system was said that it's very hard for any victim of torture to raise a complaint or to get justice from the torturer because it's hard to prove. If I'm talking about my own experience and I'll just end here, I've been handcuffed, blindfolded. I cannot see anything. I only hear voices. I only feel the torture. And uh, I cannot say that this guy or that guy tortured me. And with this way of telling your story, it's not gonna be acceptable by uh, others. I mean, the protocol for the NGOs, if you are going to document or submit a testimony about your torture, they need, an extensive detail about what's happened, how many steps you from your uh, cell to the bathroom or these kind of things, which you cannot as a victim of torture. Uh, if you are a victim of torture, uh, your memory will be hunt. You might suffer of the PTSD or post-trauma stress disorder. So everything in your life is changed. I'll just end it by this. Last night I was on Twitter and I hear, I read a story, or it's not a story, it's a tweet, three or four tweets by one of the uh, prisoners. She, she was released, but she was talking that I cannot remember, I cannot visit my memory of that period when I was arrested. It was for a short time, but I still feared, feared to remember what was happening to me. So what I wish in this day is the immunity for those torturer to be end and to put, to put a system or a way that those doesn't feel safe after they committed these crimes. And thank you. Ali, thank you so much um, for joining us and for, for sharing your, your own personal insights um, on your experiences. I think I can speak on behalf of everybody to say we're honored to, to have you and to be able to listen to this. Um, it's so key what you raised, um, everything, but particularly regarding the difficulty um, for victims and survivors of torture to raise complaints, uh, the difficulty of proving these things, and in particular, 
the impunity that's ongoing around this issue in Bahrain. Um, and I think that links with some things that Joe mentioned. So thank you so much, Ali Abdullah Mam, um, for, for, for speaking. So now our final speaker we'll move on to, and then, um, then we'll open the floor for questions. Um, I'd like to welcome Maya Oppenheim, who is the women's editor of The Independent, um, and who will be sharing her experience on conducting research into the use of torture against female, female activists and detainees in Bahrain. Um, Maya's coverage on this very un underreported issue uh, included Najah Youssef's first interview after being released from prison last August. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about her work. Um, so Maya, if you, would, if you would like to begin, thank you. Sorry, I'm just unmuting myself. Hi guys. Um, Thank you so much for asking me to come. Uh, yeah, let me know if there's any issues and you can't hear me or see me or whatever. Um, so I'm just gonna tell, retell the accounts of women's rights activists who were imprisoned at Isotown, who I previously interviewed. They're both now happily free. Um, so first I'll give a little bit of context about Isotown. It is the only detention facility for women in Bahrain. It's a notorious prison condemned by United Nations for its de degrading treatment and poor conditions. In Isotown, the officials in charge of overseeing the conditions have been trained using millions in British taxpayers' money, despite allegations that they have covered up torture and human rights abuses. Activists have long been calling for the UK funding to end. Since 2012, I think it's 6.5, yeah, I know it's 6.5 million of British taxpayers' money has been spent on training Bahraini public institutions, including the Ministry of Interior Ombudsman and Special Investigation Unit, which have been condemned by human rights organisations across the world for covering up a slew of torture allegations, as well as unlawful executions. So first I'm going to relay the story of Medina Ali, a women's rights activist who was released at the end of last year after more than two years in Isotown. To give a little bit of context, Medina had taken part in peaceful protests calling for equal rights and democratic change in Bahrain. Medina was driving to work when ordinary looking men in a car pulled her over and held her at gunpoint back in 2017. She was pulled into the vehicle where she was blindfolded before being transported to a horse stable. She described the whole scenario as an abduction because they were wearing civilian clothes. There were four men, they all had their guns raised. They blindfolded her and took her to the horse stable. There was a room nearby where she says interrogation began. It was aggressive and threatening, she said. She also told me she was threatened with rape and they threatened to rape her mother and younger sister just to kind of quote which some of some of what she said verbatim she said they hit me all over my body they took my head and started knocking it against the wall until I sustained serious bruises the mark from this incident is still there you can feel it when you touch my forehead miss Ali says she said um, I'll just call her first name actually, Medina, um, so she suffered extremely harsh treatment throughout her sentence. She told me that guards led by the major in charge of the facility physically assaulted both her and fellow, her fellow cellmate Haja Mansur, um, who's also now fortunately been released and that was back in September 2018. She said that after being denied access to take part in religious rituals, they were punished and beaten and the head of the prison punched her back. The pain ended up staying with her for several days. She also gave me another example of suffering from uterine bleeding that lasted for over a month and despite repeated requests to be seen by a doctor or specialist doctor, she was denied. In her own words, I lived with my own suffering and misery. There was one incident where I was strip searched following a visit by my family. I was asked to take all my clothes off. It was very humiliating. Prison was an extremely painful experience. They also placed a glass barrier for family visits, which was very difficult because I have a child, a boy who is eight years old. I was often in my cell for 23 or 22 hours a day. She says she was also barred from speaking to other prisoners and blocked from having relatives visit her at various points during her time in jail. The case of Medina has been raised by groups including Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International on a number of occasions. I'm also going to tell the story of Naja Youssef. Naja is a Bahraini activist who was jailed after criticising Formula One's Grand Prix. Speaking to me in her first interview since leaving jail, Naja told me she contemplated suicide after suffering rape and abuse at the hands of the state 
states authorities. Naja, a former civil servant who was in fact fired over her jail sentence, was imprisoned in April 2017 after condemning the Bahraini Grand Prix and wider human rights abuses in Bahrain on Facebook. The mother of four, who was pardoned and freed from prison in August last summer, previously told me she lives in fear of being forced to return to, to, return to jail at any moment. She also called for Formula One and Lewis Hamilton to acknowledge the human rights violations she has suffered and urged the, the authorities to launch an investigation into her treatment. As far as I know, that has yet to happen, but someone please correct me if I'm wrong. Naja argued Formula One should not be racing in a country when human rights abuses occur, explaining that she was concerned about this and the government's attack on freedom of expression and their treatment of protesters and citizens, so she spoke out. Naja said she was called into the police station with her 14-year-old son and a member of the Bahraini intelligence services forced her to unlock her mobile phone before interrogating her about her involvement in politics. In her own words, I was terrified for my own safety and that of my son. I was asked to work with the authorities as an informant, but I refused. Their attitude totally changed then. They became very aggressive. Over the next four days, I slept at home, but would go back to the Mah Maharak police station each day where a third officers beat me and threatened me with rape. They also threatened to kill me and told me they would kill my children. They said they would fabricate an accident which happened to the children but kill them, saying everything will look normal, we can do this to you. While being interrogated in police custody, I was also raped. My dignity was destroyed. At one point, I was thinking of killing myself and throwing myself from a window so I could end the suffering. But I, I thought, even though they are already keeping me in hell, I do not want to kill myself. I was shocked the person who was the head of the police station where I was sexually assaulted and tortured was the beneficiary of a British taxpayer's scheme. Naja voiced outrage the British government had sent a delegation of Dur Durham police to the station. For those that don't know, Durham is um, the place where Dominic Cummings drove up to recently. It's um, up in the north of England. Um, so yeah, she was, yeah, Naja was shocked that the British government had sent a delegation of Durham police to the station where she alleged she was sexually assaulted. She felt like this was a betrayal. Although there is no suggestion that Brigadier Fawaz Hassan Al Hassan was involved in abusing her or sanctioned any such abuse, he was officially in charge of the police station at the time and is the most senior police officer in the area. He has carried out training in the UK, which the British taxpayer footed the bill for as part of a £16,000 programme on command and control. A spate of incidents of abuse are alleged to have taken place at the station under his watch. Naja said she was on her period during her first day in Isotown Detention Centre and asked for sanitary products and soap to have a shower, but was refused. Miss Naja said the conditions there felt like an extension of the torture from the police station and prison guards would scream and swear at her. She said the prisoners felt very vulnerable that they would be attacked at any time by the prison and there would be no consequences for their actions. She said she was only allowed to see her family once from September 2018 until she was released late, a summer later. Naja's 85-year-old father-in-law, Mansour Salman, died from suffocation in 2012 after heavy amounts of tear gas was fired into their local area. Um, okay, well, I'm going to stop now, but yeah, thank you again so much for um, asking me to talk and looking forward to hearing some, yeah, other questions. Thank you, Maya, so much. Thank you for sharing um, these very important stories of Medina, uh, Naja and Haja. Um, which are harrowing, and also noticing, noting the problem of British funding and training to the country. These short stories sharing and platforming is so crucial. Um, they really mustn't go unheard, and quotations like those you shared, as well as the lived experiences of all Bahraini survivors of torture must really be amplified and kept alive um, so as to inform the work for the elimination of such abuses and the impunity surrounding them. Thank you, Maya. Um, I believe that Etasam Al Sayeg has some comments to share with us uh, at this point. Um, Etasam is a Bahraini human rights defender um, herself. So, Etasam, I will pass the over to you. And I think Hussein Abdullah of um, Americans for Democracy and Human Rights in Bahrain will be kindly translating her comments. Thank you, Etasam. Please go ahead. Okay. 
وان لم نستطع ان نلتقي ولكننا خلقنا اجواء افتراضيه لنصل لايصال صوت الضحايا وايضا لنتعهد بمساندتهم واقعا انا كناشطه في حقوق الانسان في البحرين كنت مؤمنه بانني ساكون هدف للسلطه في اي لحظه لان هذا الشعور يتوارد لدى الجميع سواء كان ناشطا او مدافع عن حقوق الانسان او كان ناشطا سياسيا او ناشطا في اي مجال من مجالات التي تعبر عن عن الراي او تعترض عن ما يحدث في الانتهاكات فهناك اكيد سيكون استهداف ابتسام ام ساده خليني اترجم اللي قلتيه علشان اوكي سو وات ام جونا دو ام جونا جست انترابت ابتسام وان ايفر اي ريتش ا بوينت وير اي وود لايك تو ترانسليت بيفور وي لوز ا لوت اوف هير امبورتنت مسج سو شي بيجان باي ثانك يو ثانك يو اول اوف يو تو بارتيسيبيت ان ذس امبورتنت ايفنت ذات شوز ذات وي وير ايبل تو اوفركم ذا كورونا بانديميك باي ميتينج فيرتشوالي تو سبورت فيكتيم اوف تورتشر As a Bahraini woman human rights defender, she knew very well that her activities and activism and her work uh, uh, will cause her one day to become a target uh, uh, of the Bahraini government. However, this meeting we're having today uh, sends a very uh, strong uh, uh, message to the victims of torture, not only in Bahrain, but also uh, in the region. Uh, go ahead, Sam. في الواقع نحن كبحرينيين نحن كبحرينيين جميعنا كل منزل في البحرين تعرض اهله او احد افراد عائلته الى الاستهداف وهذا الاستهداف لم يكن وليد اليوم ولا عشر سنوات ولا عشرين سنه ولا ثلاثين سنه انا ما زلت اتذكر وانا بعمر تسع سنوات كيف تم اعتقال والدي واختفاه عنا لاشهر وبعد ذلك تم الافراج عنه وابتزازه ماديا كونه تاجر الوضع في الوضع عندما ساتحدث عن خروجي من وهذا هي علامه تعجب بالنسبه لجميع كيف انك رصدت الكثير من حالات الضحايا كيف انك كنت معهم وتسمعين جميع قصص الامهم وقصص التعذيب ومع ذلك كانت سبع ساعات كفيله بجعلك في حاله انهيار عصبي Um, uh, we in Bahrain, uh, uh, every house uh, in the country is targeted. Every house in the country almost has a victim. And it's, it's a systematic uh, uh, human rights violations, not only, I'm not talking about now, I'm not talking about 10 or 20 or 30 years. I'm talking much longer than that. I remember very well when I was nine years old, uh, uh, authorities or, or uh, security forces came ram uh, 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 ramping my or came to my house and uh, uh, arrested my father's my father for months we did not know where he was uh, then they exploited uh, his situation and basically uh, uh, took some funds from him because they knew very well he was uh, a businessman uh, i always get asked this question uh, how we were able to document Uh, uh, these uh, uh, horror stories, how you were able to document these human rights violations. Uh, a, normal, uh, uh, a normal person will not be able to sustain what you went through. Seven hours is, is more than enough to, to basically uh, uh, crash someone. Go ahead, Sam. طبعا في خلال هاي السبع ساعات انا تعرضت للكثير يعني تعرضت الى التعذيب والقهر وسحق كرامتي وايضا الاعتداء الجنسي والتحرش الجنسي بادئا وبعد ذلك الاعتداء الجنسي كان بالنسبه لي صادما ليس لانني لم لم اسمع عن هذا من قبل ولكن كوني ناشطه ومدافع عن حقوق الانسان شاركت في جنيف ولدي الكثير من المعارف ويعرفون نهجي في مجال حقوق الانسان ومع ذلك لم يردع هذا الشيء الجلادين والقائمين على تعذيبي كنت اصرخ واقول لهم هذا مخالف للقوانين وهذا ما تفعلونه هل يعلم به الملك وهل تقبلون ان يحدث لي احد من افراد عائلتكم ما تفعلون فيه ولكن كنت اتعرض للكمات المستمره وكان كنت اشعر ايضا بحاله من الاحباط هذا اللي اثر علي كثيرا كوني مدافع عن حقوق الانسان وانا خلال عشر سنوات اجتهدت ان اكون جزء من هذا النشاط لمساعده الضحايا وجدت في ذلك اليوم بان كل هذا العمل الذي نقوم به ليل ونهار لم 
يستطع حماية الضحايا أو إيقاف التعذيب أو ردع من يقومون بالتعذيب حسين الصوت الصوت I apologize for the, for that. In these seven hours, I have been through a lot, both physical and and mental or mental uh, torture. Where I physically was was beaten, and then first sexually harassed, and then after that sexually attacked. I have heard about these stories in the past from other victims, but to go through it, it's completely a, a, a different experience, especially for a woman human rights defender in my situation, where I know many. Uh, uh, NGO or I know many personality I have been I, I went to Geneva and participated in the Human Rights Council when I when all these horrible things and this basically this torture was happening to me during the sexual attack I was screaming I was telling the attacker this is illegal uh, uh, do you know what are you doing uh, uh, does do you have family member will you will you be okay or will you how would you feel if such thing is happening uh, 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 to your family member? Does the king know that you you guys are doing these things? For the last 10 years, I've been documenting cases of human rights violations. I've been working hard and, and basically assisting victims of torture. And then all of a sudden, I felt so down. I felt that all this work is meaningless because it could not uh, assist me. It could not stop these horrible things from happening to me. Go ahead, Sam. خلال هذه الفترة أيضا القصص تستمر وما زالت هناك حالات كثيرة تصلنا على يتم استهداف حقوقهم البسيطة يعني بعد تعرضهم إلى الاعتقال التعسفي والاعترافات تحت وطأة التعذيب وهناك إثبات وتوثيق وأيضا تصدر محاكم ضدهم وبينهم أطفال وبينهم أشخاص مرضى يعانون من أمراض خطيرة قد تعرض حيات تعرض حياتهم إلى الموت ومع ذلك الأحكام والاعتقالات مستمرة لهؤلاء لجميع الفئات واليوم عندما تصل هذه الأصوات لتطالب بأبسط الحقوق الدواء أو العلاج وحتى وجدت في الأحكام البديلة وجدت مخرج للتنفس لأنهم لا يتنفسون خلف القضبان لأنهم محرومين من كل الحقوق علاج الأدوية وأيضا حتى التعليم مغيبين عشر سنوات ضاع, ضاع, ضاع الكثير مستقبلهم وهم موجودين خلف القضبان باعترافات تحت وطأة التحديب وتحت مر العالم والمنظمات الحقوقية والتوصيات الدولية التي تصدر كل أربع سنوات ومع ذلك لم نستطع الانتصار لقضية من القضايا اليوم الناشط الحقوقي عبد الهادي الخواجة تعرض إلى التحرش أول الأشخاص الذي تعرض إلى التحرش الجنسي وهو مدافع عن حقوق الإنسان ما زال يقبع في السجن ولا توجد جهة استطاعت أن تقول يجب أن يخرج هذا الأستاذ بأسرع ما يمكن وأن يكون هناك إلزام للسلطة لإخراج المدافعين عن حقوق الإنسان فهناك تراجع تراجع إلى النشطاء حقوق الإنسان لدى لاحظنا وجود أو غياب عدد كبير من النشطاء خوفا من الملاحقة والاعتقال اليوم أنا موجودة بينكم وأتحدث وأريد أن أتحدث لأن هذا الشيء يجعلني أشعر بالارتياح لإيصال صوت البقية خلال أربعة أشهر أنا موجودة داخل الزنازين 31 يوما كنت مضربة عن الطعام نزل وزني كثيرا وأعاني من مشاكل صحية منذ تلك اللحظة حتى اليوم أربع شهور كفيلة بإحداث جرح كبير في نفسي فكيف بهؤلاء الأشخاص الذين قبعوا تسع سنوات أو عشر أو شكوا على وصول العشر سنوات وما زالت أصواتهم لا تسمع. I'm sure you've, you've said a lot so let me try to summarize um, and I apologize for not being literal. In this period uh, uh, we have uh, many cases we, we documented or I documented many cases you're talking about uh, uh, activists being tortured, torture is still taking place, ill treatment, people are getting sentencing. Uh, we're talking about years, ten, tens of years uh, by uh, court, and the only evidence you have is confession under uh, uh, torture. These things were documented. And when, when, when they are in prison, the, the uh, human rights violations or the ill treatment or the torture continue. Lack of uh, uh, medical care, uh, not given. Um, uh, these detainees, uh, the medicine they deserve or the medicine they need. 
uh, even the alternative sentencing that we've seen looked at it as, as an area of a breed that even have not been implemented uh, in the uh, right way. The um, right to be able to uh, uh, receive medical care is a serious issue. Uh, I have been in, in prison for four months and I know how that was horrible. So I cannot just imagine the, uh, these uh, activists or these innocent victims who are spending tens of years, I'm talking about nine years or, uh, 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 or more in prison for crimes they have not committed. The well-known human rights defenders, Abdul Hadi Al-Khawaja was the first uh, uh, who was uh, sexually uh, harassed and, 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 and attacked while he was uh, in prison tortured. Till now, despite his place on the international stage, we were not able to get him uh, out. There is some, there is a, a feeling of depression or feeling of uh, let down in the human rights community in Bahrain, especially among human rights defenders. I'm here today because it makes me feel better to be able to talk about this. So you all can hear me and the story does not die. Uh, I've been on hunger strike when I was in prison for 31 days. Uh, uh, if, if there is something uh, I wanna say that uh, uh, during uh, uh, this period, that being in that place and feeling hopelessness is, is something that you cannot imagine. خلال خلال هاي المدة ومر علينا علينا سنتين وما زلت أنا أشعر بحالة مرعبة في أثناء الظلام لأني أتذكر تلك اللحظات التي صمدت عيني ومارسوا علي التعذيب بأشكاله ما زلت أكره رائحة التدخين لأن التدخين تذكرني بذلك الجلاد الذي كان يضربني ويدخن بشراسة وكان قريب مني وحتى حرارة الولاعة التي يسعل بها الجقادة كان قريبة إلى جسدي ما زلت وأنا أطبخ الأكل لعائلتي عندما أصل إلى الحرارة أتذكر هذا الموقف بتفاصيله فكيف بضحايا لم يسمعهم أحد وهم تعرضوا إلى أشكال أفضع مما أنا تعرضت والتعذيب ما زال مستمرا والغرف السوداء ما زالت مفتوحة وما زالت الاعتقالات حتى وصلت إلى أطفال بعمر 15 سنة اليوم في هذا اليوم اليوم العالمي المساندة للضحايا أنا أتمنى أن يكون منطلقا لأن أن لا نكتفي بالبيانات ولا بنطالب أن يكون هناك لجان دولية تتقصى الحقاق وتساند الضحايا وأنا أؤكد لكم أنني مواطنة بحرينية وسأطالب أن يكون هناك أكثر من خمسة آلاف متخصص إعادة تأهيل ليدخل البحرين لأن أغلبية المعتقلين الذين يخرجون من السجون لا يجدون من يعيد تأهيلهم يتعرضون أيضا إلى أشكال أشكال جديدة من الاستهداف لا تتوقف لا يتوقف استهدافهم فهم محتاجين إلى مساندة إلى إعادة تأهيل لأنهم يخرجون مدمرين بسبب الأوضاع التي عاشوها عاشوها في داخل السجن وظروف التحقيق والمحاكمة وكل ما ذلك فأعتقد حتى عوائلهم جيرانهم اليوم الاعتقال عندما يتم اعتقال أحد لا يتم ترهيب العائلة فقط يرهبون الحي بأكمله الحي يخاف تتصورون أننا الآن في كوفيد 19 تدخل سيارات للفحص في المناطق وهي مزودة برجال الأمن الناس تكتب في التويتر والإنستغرام أنهم يشعرون بالرعب لأن هناك حالات اقتحام هي ليست حالات اقتحام ولكن عدم ثقة برجال الأمن عدم ثقة بهؤلاء القوات التي يفترض أنها تجعل الأمن يسود وحقوق الناس متنا وهي تفصل بين حقوق الناس ولكن في الواقع ليس هناك أي ثقة وأتمنى وأشكركم أنكم دعوتوني هذا اليوم أن أكون بينكم أشكركم لنش وأشكركم وأوصيكم بأن نجتهد الكثير من أجل مساندة الضحايا لأنهم فعلا محتاجين إلى يد تساندهم وتنقلهم من لحظة الظلام إلى لحظة النور شكرا لكم. I'm, I'm doing injustice uh, uh, to your statement, Abtisam, uh, uh, but I'll do my best to translate. I still feel uh, fear uh, uh, when, when, when I'm in a dark room because this reminds me of what I've been through. 
uh, remind me of the torture that took place uh, uh, against me. When I smell the uh, smell of smoke, cigarette smoke, I remember that torturer who, who used to beat me and, and violate me. Uh, even the lighter, I remember very well how close it was to my body when he was lighting his cigarette. Um, when I look at, when I, when I remember all these, when I actually cook for my family and feel the heat of the stove, I remember torture. It, 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 it doesn't matter how, how much I can tell you, it's engraved in my, in my brain and it's engraved in my, uh, 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 in my memory. We're talking about also kid, I mean, leave the adult, but we're talking about uh, victims of torture who are uh, uh, underage, 15 years old, uh, young kids, younger kids, and even younger. In this day, it's not uh, enough for us to issue statements and, and do a solidarity stand here or there, but actually we need to call for an international uh, committee that come and hold and, and investigate what happened in Bahrain and hold uh, uh, and, and uh, create some uh, accountability in the, in the country. I'm not gonna exaggerate when I tell you that we need at least 5,000 experts to come to Bahrain and basically uh, uh, offer rehabilitation. We don't have any rehabilitation program. These victims of torture, when they're released from prison, they're actually broken. They're not ready to face life and violation does not stop when they are released. It, the violation continue by the government and the harassment of these uh, different victims and activists. It's not only the family uh, that get affected when their members are, when a member of their family torture and arrested, it's the entire neighborhood because the, uh, the way these uh, security forces comes and, and, and get these uh, activists and victim is, is so uh, horrible in its nature. Just, just let me give you an example. COVID-19, the people who test uh, uh, citizens in Bahrain for COVID-19 are police. They come in and, and are actually, they, uh, they're uh, uh, escorted by uh, police. The, the neighborhood believe when they see these uh, uh, police cars that they're coming to arrest someone. So the same institution, the police officer, the security institution that actually st uh, are created to protect us, to give us some feeling of security, they are the one that people are uh, scared of. At the end, I wanna thank you for being here. Uh, I wanna uh, request from all of you that we need to show our support of, uh, uh, to victims of torture because uh, the ordeal is not easy for a human being to overcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, so much for your intervention. We are so honored to hear from you directly today. Um, Epsasam is a human rights defender who has tirelessly advocated um, internationally for the improvement of human rights in Bahrain for years, uh, despite facing extremely serious reprisals, as she has described. And further, as Epsasam importantly stated, torture isn't only physical, of course, but is psychological and includes medical negligence as well as sexual assaults and um, other things with, with enormous ramifications. And it is not only the survivors of torture themselves, um, as Aptasam noted, thank you Aptasam, but, but also their, their relatives, their friends, and indeed entire communities which continue to be impacted by the consequences of torture and abuse within a climate of fear and impunity. So thank you, Eptasam, so much for speaking with us today. Um, and I will now open the floor um, to all of our attendees to ask questions to our speakers. So if anybody does have questions um, for, for Joe, for Ali or for Maya, or indeed, I'm sure that Eptasam would be open to perhaps answering questions as well. Um, please, do, um, please do now, feel, feel free actually to write in the chat box if you have a question or, or just go ahead and and ask a question directly. Um, thank you so much. I believe we have about 15 minutes now, um, at least for questions. Can I ask a question, please? Please go ahead, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is for uh, Joe Stork. Uh, thank you, Joe. It is nice to see you after many years. Uh, and your work on Bahrain had made a difference at the time. I still remember, uh, I think, uh, your report, routine abuse, routine denial, uh, that you had edited, if my uh, memory serves me well. So after 25 years, what, what is it in your mind to explain to us 
uh, why torture continues despite the uh, naming and shaming still we see uh, the same uh, torture that you had protested against uh, and challenged in 1996 is be uh, during that uh, Said al uh, uh, that year about this time in 96 he was uh, killed under torture why is it that the same picture the same people are facing the same fate uh, under a new ruler, the ruler who took over in 1999. So why is it? Why is it? Why is it? Why? What is the relation between torture and dictatorship? Is it? Well, well, thank you, thank you, Saeed, for that very easy question. Um, look, as I tried to say in my remarks, I think the issue is the absence of accountability because of the deterrence factor. There is no deterrence. So when uh, uh, police or prison guards, for instance, or for that matter, the Minister of Interior and uh, the other upper political echelon uh, have uh, no reason to fear any consequence for this kind of behavior, uh, it's likely to uh, reoccur when, uh, when, when you have people arrested on uh, genuine or not so genuine security type charges. And, and you know, in Bahrain, like in other places, security has a broad, uh, covers a, a lot of so-called cri speech crimes, thought crimes uh, and the like. Uh, so I, I'd say the short answer is the absence of accountability and particularly the, the deterrent, the dimension of deterrence that's part of accountability. Uh, now, what is the reason for that? You might argue that, or I would argue that certainly one reason is that is the there's a protection uh, racket going on here. There's a you have the role of particularly I'd say the United Kingdom, um, uh, also the United States, uh, other European uh, states that are uh, friendly with Bahrain, uh, France, for instance. Um, you know, th th there's there's been no cons there's been no efforts, no serious efforts to to really uh, hold the government accountable in terms of conditionality on uh, assistance to the police in the case of the UK, uh, military uh, relationship in the terms in the case of, of the US. Um, so I mean, there, I, 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 would, I would be wrong to suggest there were never any attempts at that. There were some attempts at that after 2011, particularly under the Obama administration in the US, but not much. And even when that was the case, uh, Bahrain was able to play the US off against the UK. The US was the bad guys in that respect. Uh, the UK could, could found, faithfully be counted on to provide not only uh, financial, uh, technical assistance, et cetera, but run political interference in places like the UN Human Rights Council and, and so forth. So it's a very, the, the answer has to be a somewhat complex one, but it's the absence of deterrence. And the reason for that is uh, there, there, there's, there's no accountability even at the, the, um, the very largest, at the, at, the global, at the global level. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, so much. Um, um, I was wondering if I could ask a question. Go ahead, please. Um, so I think, I think this is towards Joe, uh, just because of, I mean, it, it's, it's up to everyone to ask, answer, but uh, I think one of the biggest issues that we're seeing in the Middle East is a, a targeted use of disinformation campaigns. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering how can non-governmental organizations who are not non-profit or, or funded by, by, the, by a, an insider state like the United Kingdom or United States, how can we, as organizations sort of combat robust state-funded disinformation campaigns that sort of everything that we say as a non-governmental organization is almost confounded on the opposite side by these state-run disinformation campaigns? Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's a good question, very difficult to answer. Um, Look, the, the disinformation campaigns are run at, at many levels by, by different 
different states. I mean, not only the state of Bahrain itself, but its protectors in the region like Saudi Arabia uh, and, and on the global stage, the ones I just mentioned, US, UK primarily. Um, so there's, a, there's disinformation, misinformation from all, at all levels, or at the very least, there's a, a reluctance or a refusal to combat misinformation and disinformation. You know, one. What do we do? What do we NGOs do? Uh, we we it, it's it's become much more difficult for us because you know the last time I was allowed into Bahrain was in March 2011. It's been a long time. Uh, it's true for most of my colleagues too. I mean, when I was PNG'd, it was told, oh, it's just Joe Store. You know, send somebody else. It's just, in, in fact, they're not. They don't allow anybody in from Human Rights Watch. Have not for many years. Uh, Amnesty has faced much the same picture, and I think it's true of uh, any, any anybody, any of you who are working with NGOs are in the in the same boat. I, I doubt if there's anybody on this call uh, who's been able to visit Bahrain uh, in in the last uh, five or six years. If they if you are, please raise your hand. Love to hear from you. So I mean, that's one of the one of the problems is is suppression of of information. Uh, I think BIRD and ADHRB have done a great job in trying to, in helping to break through that suppression uh, with its with their capabilities, uh, which some of us internationals don't have of, of direct links with people on the ground to be able to get the kind of testimonies that we've heard just today uh, and the kind of testimonies that went into uh, the, the BIRD report on uh, on uh, abuse of, of women in detention. Um, there's not, you know, we've got to keep slogging away at it. Uh, we've got to uh, figure out new, you know, we, we, we've got to look for allies. I would say, I mean, obviously I'm based in Washington. I'm most familiar with the scene in the United States. Uh, but, you know, one thing we, 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 were, we were urging, okay, the U.S. ambassador now in Bahrain should uh, who I don't think is a particular friend of human rights. He's not, a, he's not hostile, but he's also not really on our side. Um, we say, look, what you should do now that Nabil Rajab has been transferred from prison to home is go and visit him at his home, you know? Um, put, put your arm around him and congratulate him on now no longer being incarcerated. Uh, a, a U.S. Senator, Chris Murphy, did visit by, uh, Nabil's family a couple of months ago. Uh, he tweeted about it with pictures of himself and, and Nabil's wife and son and daughter. Uh, I think that kind of thing, that kind of, those kind of expressions of support uh, for, uh, for human rights defenders uh, and, and, and peaceful dissidents is, is, is absolutely essential. So I think even if we can't, when we can't get uh, and a, a presidential administration or the FCO or whatever to do the right thing, you know, you, you do have, and, and again, BIRD has been uh, doing a great job, I think, in, in trying to get uh, UK MPs uh, to, to speak out, to ask questions, to parliamentary questions. Uh, you know, we've just, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't know of a silver bullet. I don't know if there's something we have to do differently, but I do know we have to keep, uh, pushing away uh, using the same tools that we've got. And we, we, we are having a difference. I mean, I think, I think the fact is there's a, um, you know, I would argue there's, there's a problem in that tor torture remains endemic in, mm -hmm. in Bahrain. That it's, um, is it as bad as it was in the eighties and nineties? I'm not sure it is, but you know, again, I, I fear that the main reason for that is because the, of the relatively successful suppression of, of political activism on the ground. And so you don't have as many detainees, so you don't have as many people you can torture. Joe, uh, thank but, you so much. Yeah. I'm so, I do apologize. I'm going to have to cut you a little bit short, just, just uh, being aware of the time. But thank you for that um, very, very valuable response. Um, just we can get a few more questions in. Um, I believe Hussein, Abdullah, you, you have a question next um, before we go on to further questions. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Josie. My, my question is to Ali Abdul Imam as a, a victim of torture. We just heard Ibtissam talking about lack of rehabilitation. Um, you, you, you were arrested, obviously, before her. You went through this horrible ordeal uh, before her. 
when you got out, Ali, were you able to, of course, there was no official rehabilitation, but what I'm interested to, to hear, how you as a victim of torture were able to recoup with that and where, how would you advise others? So if there is someone who would you advise who went through an ordeal like you, what really made, made it, I'm not gonna say easy or easier, but how you were able to overcome this? What are, if there are pointers you wanna give to victims of torture, to go, uh, what kind of rehabilitation process they have to go through? Hello, thanks. Thank you, Hussein. And uh, before I answer, I would like to say that this point in the question is the point that I've been trying to work on it in the past few years with some of the victims who are suffering from the PTSD. The first thing is we, we don't have an awakeness about the PTSD in, in Bahrain. We have many political prisoners, torture victims. They are suffering from symptoms, but they don't know what is it. So this is one of the issues that we are having it in Bahrain. The second thing is I'm not an expert to tell others what to do or what's not to do because it's individual cases. It's not a cumulative that you can uh, draw a line that everybody can follow. For example, for some pay people, it's worth to talk about your supper. But for others, it might be not a good idea to talk about your uh, torture or your suffering or the things happening to you. Uh, for me personally, as I've been trying to mention several times in several occasions that the torture changed me. And as my father used to say, that the strike that didn't kill you, it will strength you. So for me personally, I felt that um, uh, I've been, be, I became more stronger, more wiser about the situation and about myself. I became a better understanding of myself because of this experience. But again, there are some points or some turns when you came that you don't understand yourself and you need to seek help from others. It depends on wh where are you going to seek help, but uh, at some point you might need to go to see a doctor or to see a friends or uh, if I may just again mention the tweets that I see it yesterday, the, pe uh, the person who was tweeting, she was asking, should I write about this, about what happened to me or should I ignore it? And when I asked myself how, how I will advise her, should she write or should she ignore it? I couldn't answer it. So it's a very hard to, uh, question and I cannot claim that I, I have an expertise to answer it, but I strongly encourage every victim of torture to seek an answer for this and to go through a rehabilitation because without it, you might not notice it, but it might destroy your whole life. Uh, I have some stories that some families been fall apart because the husband went from prison or the wife came out from prison and they cannot cooperate again. There are some hidden areas that they cannot talk about it. They cannot confront each other about what's happening. One of my friends who will sadly have to divorce his wife and leave his kids and live like an isolation because he couldn't cope with the world outside. He couldn't tell his wife what's happening to him inside prison. He couldn't look into the eyes of his kids and how they will imagine him as a hero, but he know what's happening inside the prison. So he now became, uh, he have a PTSD and he have a suicidal thoughts um, I don't want to talk more about him, but uh, to the limit, I can say that his life is destroyed and I cannot, I'm not sure that he can recover or even the rehabilitation can do much better to him. What I can encourage at the end is for all other NGOs and activists to focus more on those victims on their emotional side and personality because they really need it and they don't know that they really, they need this kind of support. 
I thank think you, I'll stop Ellen. here. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that very powerful response. Um, it's wonderful to hear from yeah. you again. Um, would anybody else have, have a question at this point for Ali or perhaps um, to other speakers? Please go yeah, ahead. I do have a, a question. Uh, yeah. uh, I would want to know what approach you think is more effective for the EU or even international community to release political prisoners in the Middle East? public pressure or uh, private channels such as multilateral dialogues and communication channels via embassies? Thank you for your question. And if I can ask speakers just to, just to keep their responses fairly short since we're coming to the end, um, that would be great. So Joe, I see you raising your hand, please. Yeah, please uh, look, all of the above or both of the above. I mean, there's no, there's no contradiction between both and you have to do both. The problem is that governments typically say, oh, we're working behind the scenes, we're doing this diplomatically and so forth. Well, that's almost always not enough. If it's enough, then, then it shows the prison, prisoners will be released. When they're not released, you know it's not enough and you have to go public. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, Ali, Maya, or Abdusan, would you have anything just to just to add in, in response to, to this question? Perhaps Maya. Um, otherwise, I um, I think I agree with the. Uh, uh, but what I want to mention is that through these years, the private channels isn't effective much with the changing the situation in the ground. I encourage to do both public or private or behind the doors, but I don't, it's very limited the impact of private channels. Thank you very much, Ali, thank you. Um, and on this note, I believe that we have run out of time, unfortunately. So um, I'll have to end it here just by conveying our sincere thanks to everybody who's attended, um, spoken and also, also asked questions. Um, this event today and hear hearing from speakers has really served to highlight the ongoing severity of torture um, in Bahrain and all of its enormous consequences, as well as, as well as serving as a reminder of how crucial shared stories are, um, as well as the importance of solidarity in striving for the respect of human rights and the elimination of torture in Bahrain. Um, I think Ali as well made a particularly important point in noting that it is up to us to make sure that these words uh, do not fall on deaf ears. It's up to us to sign petitions, to write to our MPs, to raise our voices, um, to actively engage, and ultimately to create a world where nobody has to share the stories like those that we've heard today. A particular thanks goes to Ali Abdulaman and Ebtisam Al Sayyid for speaking about their own personal experiences of torture um, and sharing their voices with us today, as well as, of course, to Joe Stork and to Maya Oppenheim. Please do remember to follow BIRD Bird and ADHRB on social media, subscribe to our newsletter and stay engaged, uh, stay engaged with our work. Torture and human rights violations can't only be platforms today, of course, on the International Day in support of the victims of torture, but must be worked for continuously. Thank you so much to everybody for attending and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.